It's Friday. It's pre-recorded. Now the show doesn't love the Nine Years Podcast. Welcome back to the Nine Years Podcast. We have returned our first show of the new decade, our first show of the year 2020. Ironically, Stu, our eyesight is probably getting worse as the years tick by. And now I'm getting, I'm, I'm going to be 26 this year. Oh my word. Wow. I might have to be, oh, I'm going to have no hair, no eyesight, no nothing left. No, oh, scary times. Anyway, welcome to the Nine Years Podcast. I am Nick Draper. I am, of course, joined by the face of the BBC Sport website, Mr. Stuart Deacons. And Stu, it is good to be back, isn't it? After what is, well, it feels like it's been about a month. I suppose it has been nearly, maybe three weeks. But it just seems longer because of the Christmas New Year period that tends to go on for about eight months. Yeah, it has felt a little while. Um, we have also a couple of weeks off, haven't we? But um, it's like we've had, we've sort of introduced our sort of like Christmas or you know, like the, the Premier League have been trying to create this sort of like winter break. Um, we've had our winter break, haven't we? We feel refreshed. Our bookings have now been rescinded and we're ready to go. We don't get any bookings. You mean like well, to make guest appearances? Yeah, like just, well, <laughs> pop down to prism it, on a Saturday night and wave at the fan? Isn't it a time that everything gets sort of refreshed and stuff like that? And also we've got a transfer window. So, hey, we can sack George again, but there's nobody coming in to replace him. How can you replace George anyway? Well, let's not answer that question, because we could get into a lot of trouble. With Well, actually, should we put that out to the listeners? The listeners, tweet us at 9 Years Podcast at 9 Wireless Podcast. What would be, or who would be, a good replacement for George? Liam Trotter is not an acceptable answer. He's in America at the moment, isn't he? Just getting money out of him. He may be back, you never know. He may, he may appear, I don't know, he may appear someone like Salford or someone like that, do you know what I mean? Desperately for the same experience. Who would go to Salford? Exactly. Mm. Well, you have mentioned players going up north to League Two teams with lots of money, and you have mentioned the transfer window. We will start this, I was going to say this week, but I guess this week, this month, this year, this decade, by discussing the January transfer window and what's been happening with our own comings and goings. We're going to review all the games we've played since we last had a podcast, so we've got four games to sort of cast our eyes over and how things have changed in League One over that time. We're going to preview Saturday's game or trip to Portsmouth. And yes, the game is back. We have a brand new game to play, Stu, which I'm sure we're very much looking forward to. Can't wait. I bet you can't. But let us begin. As I say, January transfer window, and these are the headlines so far. As of the 10th of January 2020, so Michael Felivi and Ryan Delaney, their loans have finished. So Michael Felivi has returned to Watford. And I'd very much like to thank Michael for leaving. <laughs> See what I did there? But I wish him well at Watford because that's I would that's a fate worth the death to be honest with you. And then Ryan Delaney gone back to Rochdale. Other headlines, Max Sanders has extended his stay. He remains with us for the remainder of the season, which is fantastic news. And we have brought in a centre-half from Brentford. I am not sure if I'm going to get his first name pronounced correctly, but I'm going to give it a go as Madsbeck Sorensen. It's a great name, isn't it? It's a great name. I think I hear Sorensen. I think Thomas Sorensen. And I think I'm going to end up calling this guy Thomas, no matter what happens. But... <laughs> well, on his um, Wikipedia page, he's sometimes known as Madsbeck. Well, that's strange because that's his first and middle name. So I wonder why is he called that. Um, but yeah, I think Sorensen's a great name. I can't think of any other name to create for him. Um, but yeah, welcome along to the Madhouse. That very, very good. I'm sure instead of Mads Beck, I'm sure Mad Bex was a headline in some of the red top papers, probably back in the late 90s, early 2000s. But hey, moving on. Other bit of news, Nick Zanov, he remains on loan at Sutton for the remainder of the season as well. That's probably the biggest news, isn't it, of all of them? Yeah, I think it's. Um, I think the biggest thing for me was that we kept on Max Sanders. I think that's great news. That's just an extension. Um, it's good that um, 
Brighton were happy with his loan spell and and uh, uh, Max wanted to stay on for the rest of the season. I suppose we're now just waiting for uh, Marcus Force to hopefully extend his... Well, not even extend his... Obviously, just get past Brentford being able to recall him. But for the fact that it looks like he's had a nice word in the ear of Mads Beck Sorensen to come along to Wimbledon, it, you'd hope that that would indicate that Marcus is going to stay with us. And if we... If we end the transfer window with literally getting um, you know Delaney going and Mads Beck Sorensen coming in, that's a good window. We also have a place for Felivi as well, so I suppose we've got one more coming in. Um, but at the moment, the transfer window, touch wood, looks like it's not treating us too badly. With Felivi, you said perhaps someone coming in. I'm not sure. I'm not sure there will be, will there? Because Joe Piggott, Marcus Forbes, we've got Quezia Parr returning from injury. Tommy Wood's been in the squad and been well. He got a bit of game time, hasn't he, in the first team? So maybe we're just looking at sticking with that. And I mean, the the big question mark remains over Roscoe. Who knows what's going on there? But I wouldn't be surprised if we if we don't end up bringing in another forward. I would say with our injury record this year, I think we might be if we got the budget. And that all depends what we have or not, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, for Levy going, you. Yeah, you, I think me personally, I would rather just get someone in to replace for Levy just to have the extra numbers, just because our injury record has been an absolute nightmare. You know, we, we commented, didn't we, on the Doncaster game? If you looked on the first row of the main stand, basically there's a whole row of basically our first team is not getting into the side because of injuries. Um, so I, I pretty would rather get somebody in just on the safe side. I'm not convinced that Tommy Wood is the answer, if I'm being honest with you. I think he could do with a loan still for the rest of the season. And Roscoe, hey, look, we, we've seen nothing of him, so it doesn't look likely that we're going to get much from him this season. How did you rate the contributions of Felivi and Delaney this season? Well, Felivi never got going, did he? We saw a lot of him pre-season. Um, I, I like the idea of Felivi coming back to us because I thought we could, you know... He's not an he's not a, an out and out forward. He's someone who can play in between the lines and pick up the balls and 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 drive towards defenders. But he he just never got in, into the team. He got injured. Delaney, I thought, you know, from going if we if we go back to the last transfer window when we got um, we got Force in, we got Sanders in, we got Delaney in. Delaney was the last that was a really late addition, wasn't he? And everyone looked and went, what the hell? Are we getting a Rochdale? Def-? He couldn't even get in the fifth. I think he was fifth choice centre half at Rochdale. Um, yeah. I think, you know, for a loan spell, I'm quite gutted he's gone, if I'm being truthful. Um, obviously, you know, Sorensen coming in looks a very, a very good addition. But I thought Delaney did really well. And, um, we, you know, I hope he, he obviously goes back to Rochdale and hopefully he gets into their team and, and does well. But I think he had a really good loan spell with us. I mean, Sorensen is a direct replacement. We're looking at a tall six foot two, centre half, left footed. It seems very much like for like. Like I say, Danish under-21 international, so he's recognised there. And he's coming from a Brentford side who, let's be honest, this is a Brentford team that are looking at being a Premier League team in the next five years. I mean, they could be a Premier League team next season when they kick off in the new stadium. So you would yeah. imagine the depth in their squad. They're not poor players. They're picking up quality underneath the first team. We've seen it with force already. So I'm very encur- encouraged is the wrong word, but positive about this yeah. side. Yeah, I think, you know, you have to look at it on paper. It looks like a massive upgrade from Delaney and we were quite happy with Delaney, what, what, you know, what he'd done. I think it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, Brentford also announced that they've given him a four-year contract today. So um, it's the same as when Force come to us. Um, Brentford loaned him out and then gave him a new contract. So by doing that, it clearly states that they, they're, you know, these players are very much in, in their first team plans. Um, and it also looks like, you know, we might be getting a quite a healthy relationship with Brentford. Um, and that is not a bad thing. It's good for Brentford. We're a local club. They can easily come and their scouts or their coaches can easily come down and see our games. Players don't have to move. Um, I think it's a very healthy relationship. And um, whoever's, you know, I, I, my, my understanding of that relationship is very much through uh, Joe Palmer and contacts he's got. I think it's a very healthy one. And, um, you, know, this was, you know, we're very happy with Force and Sorensen already looks like um, a very good addition for this transfer window. The only thing I'm going to say about Sorensen is, I mean, in a in a potentially negative sense, and it's not negative at all, but 21 years of age. Again, average age of this team at the moment is so young, and we have to factor this into all of our thinking at all times, I think. 
you mentioned the players unavailable to us and the the game it was Oxford, wasn't it, when they were all sat in the front row, might be South End actually, Wordsworth, Wagstaff and Nightingale still injured. These are our experienced players, our captains who aren't available for us. Terrell picked up a knock, Rob McDonald's been injured. We're so very, very young still and I kind of move on from there to the point that because of that we've ended up as Joe Piggott re- returning or being given the captaincy back in the absence of Nightingale Wagstaff Wordsworth and I want to talk about the four games we've had over Christmas, and I wanted to talk about one of the key things I've picked from that time, which is the fact that Piggott was captain. And what are your thoughts on that? Because this is dividing a lot of opinion over the last few games in terms of how fans have viewed his performances. And we can pick up his performance levels in a moment, but we mentioned it earlier in the season when he took over the captain's armband. I think it was in the very early stages of the season, wasn't it, if I remember correctly? Um, before Wordsworth had come back in, when Will first got injured and... He just doesn't strike me as a captain. No, he's not. Uh, it's difficult, isn't it? I think. Well, I think Glenn gave it to him purely because of his seniority. You know, his senior position. He is one of the older, older players in the league. Um, in the league, in in our team. So, I think that was more the reason why he got it. Um, but I, I just don't know whether it actually. Like you could argue, yeah, you know, he's got two goals, and I, I think he gave him a goal against Bristol Rovers, and he got a goal against Oxford. So he. he he got two league goals whilst being captain. So people may argue, well, that might have helped him. I'm not so sure. I think it's a pressure that he doesn't need. Getting goals at the moment is really his job. I don't really want anything extra. Um, it's, see, captains can be one of two things. They can be inspirational, inspirational characters in terms of how they perform uh, as a captain, or they can be a leader of men in terms of how they're vocal and how they how they talk to their team. And I just don't see Piggott as either of those. Um if you'd ask me who I would I give the captaincy to, that's a difficult one. I probably would give it to one of the centre halves in terms of um, McDonald or or Tyra Thomas. I'm being honest with you, just because I think after that they're the more senior um, pros, even though they're not exactly ancient in this team. Um, but I, I just think Piggott doesn't really need that. Um, but in, until you know, Wagstaff and and so forth respond and return, then I think he's going to be a captain for a continuum of time. His time of Christmas, he said he's got some goals, got a goal in a win over Bristol Rovers. Let's look at our record then. So since we last spoke to you, our glorious listeners, back in December, we've had four games. Tranmere away, we had the two home games, Oxford and Southend, and Bristol Rovers away on Boxing Day. Four points from 12. I think, if memory serves me correctly, when we did last appear on the podcast, I said I'd be happy with five We've fallen quite short of that. But looking at the league on a whole, I'm looking, if you look at the bottom six or, um, yeah, the bottom six, you look at the other five teams down there currently, because right now we're 19th. So we're 19th at the moment with three points above the relegation places. Tranmere have that final spot. They have got a game in hand on us. But Tranmere only matched us. They got four out of 12 and they had beaten us. So <coughs> only one from their last nine. Um, Rochdale only three they got three defeats. They had one win in their four Christmas games. Southend only played three times. Again, I mean, they haven't won a game in forever. They got two points. Bolton picked up. Bolton actually outperformed us over the course by a point. They got five out of 12. But really, it's it's much for muchness. The big winners, unfortunately, were Milton Keynes, who got two wins and a draw. But really, it's much for much. That four points, yeah, OK, it's less than pop as we'd have anticipated, but it's not the end of the world. We're still in a, a strong position, and I think we've got the ability. I just think we can grind out results, and we'll come on to Glenn's record with us. But I think that's the big thing. Yes, not ideal, but South End is the big disappointment, isn't it? Because a good win away at Bristol Rovers is a tough game with Oxford. South End was the big disappointment where perhaps we've let ourselves down. But I think on the whole, we're still. St- I still put us above many of those teams I've just mentioned. Yeah, and if we look at going into, you know, if we look at the, this time last year, we were going into January, and I think at one point, I can't remember when we were, but, you know, we were 10 points adrift at one point. And I think going into the, into 2019, we were, you know, we were, in a, we were in the bottom three, really struggling to see, see where our wins going to come from. Um, I think it's a totally different story now. And I think I think one thing I like about this team at the moment is we're quite resilient. Um, we don't tend to get hammered, even though you know, we don't tend to hammer teams, but we tend to stay in games. Um, and it's going back, obviously, what I was saying at the start of the podcast. If we can keep force with, you know, 11 goals since he come to us in the window, 
that's I think the goals from force are going to be the thing that probably will keep us up. Um, so it's really, really important that we keep hold of of Marcus, Marcus Force um, because with him, I feel we're a match for for quite a lot of those teams in in the bottom half. You know, we do we do have a I think and I think you when, when I saw you over Christmas, I think you alluded to this. We have a very difficult January and February. Um, we play a lot of teams in the top half. Um, we still got to go to Rochdale and we still got Acton coming to. Sorry, we still got to Accrington. But I'm reasonably, I think as long as we can keep ourselves ahead above water in terms of we can keep, we can keep ourselves above Tramir, then I think we're okay. Um, two already out of the equation, Bowl and the South End are gone. They're never going to recover. So it's literally just fighting. We're not we're fighting for that place, but it's just trying to, you know, the trap door is, is 21st place. But I'm reasonably confident that we're, we're, we'll be okay. And that's it as well. You've mentioned we don't get beaten heavily. We don't concede great deal of goals. We, we don't keep clean sheets, but we don't concede great deals. I'm looking at the other teams around us. Tranmere got hammered at home by Coventry. I think they lost by four. Rochdale got a couple of two goal defeats. I think they got a four-one, a three-one at Burton. Southend concede goals for fun, unless they're playing us, of course. Bolton shipping goals throughout this time. So these teams, they have what I'd say is we don't. See, we seem to have hit under Glynn a level of performance sort of every week consistently. But in terms of, okay, the quality might be severely lacking, but the amount of effort we put in and the fact that we're compact and we are we are difficult to beat. Oxford are going to be the best team we've played this season. Okay, yes, they made a number of changes, but they found the same problem playing against us, which was we don't give much away. We don't let teams get in behind us particularly often. We crowd the penalty area. We defend our box really, really well. And I think that's going to help us. We've we've dug out results, and like I say, the quality is severely lacking. But under Glim, we have picked out and picked up results when we haven't been playing great. And I think that's going to be, and plus with the signings we've made, and Sanders staying and Four staying, I think we're going to be absolutely fine. Yeah, and it's, I I call them cheap goals, but Marcus Force gives you cheap goals. You just get you know he does nothing outside the box, um, but comes alive in the box. I suppose it's a bit harsh when you, when you look at a goal against. Uh, Doncaster when he you know he hounded the Doncaster centre half to make a mistake, um, but what I mean is you get forced it just gets cheap goals for you. you gets into good position, can get you a goal out of nothing. Um, and I'll be honest with you, I don't see many teams in the bottom half of of the table where where we're fighting having a player that necessarily does that. Apart from maybe uh, Rochdale um, have you know I've got his name now Henderson who always comes up with ridiculous amounts of goals. But apart from them, I don't really see anyone else who's got a striker really that could probably change the game and could probably quite easily get into the top half uh, you know, of the table squad. So, big, you know, Marcus Force would turn out to be our biggest signing, massive signing in terms of as long as we keep him to the end of the window. But yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not overly worried. I, like I say, we were ten points adrift last season. We're nowhere near that disastrous state as we were. So, you know, we should be counting our lucky stars. We are where we are. And also with Rochdale and Tranmere, they've got into the third round of the FA Cup. They've both got replays in the FA Cup against Premier League teams. Their focus is clearly elsewhere at present. That's going to add to some fixed congestion. I mean, should they win replays? I think it's I think it's unlikely. But should Tranmere win their replay with Watford, and we all hope they do, they've got Wolves or Man United in the next round of the Cup. I mean, again, where the, where's their attention going to be? Where are they going to be thinking? And same with, with Rochdale. If Rochdale pull off a, a real shock and go to Newcastle and win, they've got a home game against a League One side in the FA Cup and you're suddenly thinking like we were last season, win that one, fifth round, and all of a sudden you're thinking, how far can we go? Yeah, and the benefit for us is with Oxford getting past Hartlepool, it means that that game gets postponed. So it, we you know, we said earlier, we've got a lot of injuries. So actually, and that's not ideal when you, you know, we haven't, we lost our game because Rochdale in the FA Cup and we now lose another game in January because of Oxford are. But actually, I would rather, if we can, postpone those games for when we've got our squad in a better position. Obviously, we you know we've got Sorensen coming in. So when he gets a acclimatised, it's going to take him a little while just to get used to playing in a new team and maybe a new formation. Um, but it's not the worst for the FA Cup. Us being out of it might be a little bit of a benefit um, if I can create a positive on a on a back of a getting out of the FA Cup early on. FA Cup third round, by the way, as an aside, I referenced this on Twitter, 32 third round ties, nine Saturday three o'clock kickoffs. I mean, you talk about the magic of the FA Cup. Well, the fact that we barely have any games kicking off at any point in time is not helping, in my opinion. I used to love the FA Cup third round day. You'd have like 30 games 
all Saturday, three o'clock kickoffs. It was a great day. It was exciting. You had goals going in everywhere, upsets going on all the time. All this TV nonsense is really annoying me. Modern football. I know I'm getting old, but wow. Not a well, 20, 26 is an old age. It really well, is. Well, you're 26 is old. Uh, yes, I am. Slightly, I'm slightly older than the average 26-year-old. I'm still 25, <laughs> I'd like to point out. I'll be turning 26 this year. I can't, I can't escape that one, sadly. Unfortunately. Um, also, on, as an aside, have you noticed FA Cup third round replays? <coughs> TV have decided to go for Tottenham Middlesbrough. What's that about? Who wants to watch that? That's not a game of interest. Tramir Watford is surely the pick of the replays. Premier League team, where League Two team. Always, always. Is it just me? Yeah, they talk about the magic of the FA Cup, but as soon as a third round appears, it don't really. Have, it doesn't. You know, May United always get live game on TV. Um, as you know, your Chelsea always get a home draw. They haven't. Shock horror. Um, but yeah, the magic of the FA Cup goes as soon as the big clubs come in because that's when the TV crews then. Yeah, Tottenham Middlesbrough is that really? It's not going to be a giant killing. You're right, the Tranmere home to uh, Watford after coming back from three 0 down um, would be would be my choice. But it doesn't surprise me. Um, I think the FA Cup needs it needs a lot of work. It, it, you know, a lot of the clubs now in the Premiership and the Championship are putting reserve teams out. There's no. I looked at some of the giant killings and are they giant killings? Because when you look at the squad numbers for all the teams that are appearing, they're you know they're literally thirties and forties. Um, I think the FA Cup needs, it maybe needs a qualification for Europe. It needs something, some sort of tag that makes the Premiership teams and Championship teams now take it seriously. But when you look at the amount of money that's in the, cham- you know, the Premiership and the Championship, you can hardly be surprised that these teams are doing it. The FA Cup needs, it needs something because at the moment it's just a little bit. I, I, I was like you, I was a little bit disappointed with all the games. I was going to watch them and, and I looked at the squads that were playing and I'm like, yeah, I think at one stage Rochdale were the favourites to beat Newcastle. That's crazy. That was just because the Newcastle has done up ten changes. And just to sort of hammer home this point, fourth round live TV games have been picked Man City at home to Fulham. I mean, <laughs> why? <laughs> why? Oh well. Um, it's just it's just because Man City, isn't it? Exactly. It's just daft, beyond daft. I have one suggestion that I've not heard elsewhere to help make the FA Cup appeal more. And this is use Wembley less. And I don't mean move the cup semi-finals away from Wembley. That should happen. But all the other... How often is Wembley used now? I'm sorry, the League 2 playoff final, the conference playoff finals do not need to be played at Wembley. The FA Vars and the FA Trophy finals do not need to be played at Wembley. You devalue the achievement of getting there if every Tom, Dick and Harry can play there at every level along the pyramid. I mean... There's an argument, an argument on occasions for Wembley to be used for the championship playoff final because of the size of the clubs that are involved in getting there some years. You could see that, you know, Sheffield Wednesday have been there a couple of times and Villa have been there a couple of times. These are big clubs. You sort of understand it. But really, certainly FA Cup semi-final shouldn't be there. League, no, I agree. League one, league two. Do we need to be at Wembley? Yes, we had, a, we had a great day out at Wembley. Did it need to be at Wembley? Probably not. No, um, no. Yeah, we, we were lucky in a way that we got Plymouth, but we could have got Accrington Stanley. Exactly. Well, we, you know, you know, and, and Wembley would have literally had one stand open, and that'd been the lower half of it. Yeah. Imagine just having one stand open. Could you imagine what sort of stadium would that be? Anyway. <laughs> well, yes. On that note, very quickly, I should say, listeners, the situation with our finances and the eleven million pounds and the bonds and stuff like that, we're just going to take a break from that for for this week because we've got so much football to catch up on, and really, we've got nothing else to say, have we? But I'm sure I can almost guarantee you next week that will be a main topic of conversation. But it has actually gone a little bit quiet on all those things for the time being, but I guess that comes with the time of year we're at as well. So, oh, well, right. Back to us. Sorry. Back to football. I've talked about Glenn Hodges. I've talked about our performance levels under him and the effort levels and the results we picked up. Do you want a comparison against what we've managed to do since Glenn has taken charge with what Wally did in the first 10 games of the season? Yeah, definitely. I think you know, turn of the year and new year and new, not new starts. You can't start a league again. But yeah, it'd be good to see where he was. Okay, well, Wally Downs this season had 10 league games in charge, of which we picked up three points. We had three draws and seven defeats. It seems like a lifetime ago now, Stu, but we were 11 games into the season without a win. It seems, it almost seems like it didn't happen now. Does that sound weird? 
No, yeah, no, just, I'm, like I'm sure it did. Ago. I know it did happen. It just feels so long ago. But as I say, so from a possible 30 points under Wally, you picked up three. Then Wally departed for this, that and the other reason. Since then, Glynn has come in 14 games under Glynn. And we've picked up from a possible 42 points. We've picked up 21. So we've picked up half a point per game. In it. Well, yeah, essentially that is pretty much what we've done. Um, 21 points, actually. What am I talking about, Stu? 21 points from 14 games means we've picked up a point, 1.5 points per game. That's impressive. Extrapolate that over a season, 69 points. Well, sorry, there's no Berry this year, so what, 66 points. Yeah, yeah, it's, the form's, yeah, the form's crazy. Um, it's interesting when you look at it, it's been some big wins, but I think, you know, I'm, I'm just sort of looking at the, the, the sort of the standout games that we had, and they all... In a way, Glenn needed a really good start. Um, you know, if we think about it, when to Peterborough, we were what, 3 0 down, we got, was it 3 1 down or 3 0 down? 3 0 down half time, half time yeah. uh, You know, and then got the goals back with Wordsworth. You know, as always happens, it's really weird, isn't it, when managers go, when managers um, lose their job for whatever reason. It's always weird that sometimes the star player always somehow next game appears to be fit because he didn't have Wordsworth. And, you know, Glenn was lucky to have Wordsworth in that Peterborough game. But there's two games that stand out for me. Um, was the 3-2 win against Rochdale at home, which was his first official game that he was in. Was the first official game? No, I think he was still... I think he was still time. Yeah, yeah, but we know, you know, what he wasn't around. Um, but, you know, if you remember back to being 3 up at half-time against uh, Rochdale at home and literally hanging on the dear life. I think there's some really pivotal games. I think that was a massive game of getting the belief that we could play in maybe a different way. And then the late goal against home to Pompey, uh, you know, the Toro Thomas. I think there was some really big games in October uh, that set, set that sort of belief in the squad because, you know, when Glynn come in, even though, yes, he was assistant manager to Wally, it was just a little bit of belief because we kept losing all the time. And um yeah, those two games are pivotal for me in terms of the success he had moving moving on through the season. Yeah, I mean, for me, just looking at it, I suppose the disappointment under Glynn has been the three draws have been Southend, Bolton and um, Lincoln, who were teams down there. Two of those at home and Bolton away from home where we let it slip in injury time. I suppose if you're going to look at it and say... Mm, Imagine if we'd have held on at Bolton. Imagine if we'd have held on against South Because, again, that was injury time, wasn't it? I forget um, on New Year's Day. Um, we'd have, that would that have been a big cushion. We could have been a little bit further, a little bit healthier at the table. But that might be new. Yeah, it, it swings around about, isn't it? Because we got a late equaliser at home to Lincoln, didn't we? Um, which was good in a way because that was sandwiched in between defeats at Burton and, and Blackpool. But... I get what you mean. You know, let's be fair. If we if we'd held on on you know New Year's Day against South End, and really we should have held on against a weak Bolton team, that's an extra four, that's an extra four points. You know, that would put us probably quite a few places up. But I think that the the good thing is is that we're now you know we I think we're, we're getting a we're, the resilience is quite good within the team, and I feel as we get you know as I said before, this team is really young, and it can only get more experience as it gets more games. It's not going to get any worse, I don't believe. Um, so we might see, you know, the second half of the season, that our youngsters really pushing on, and because they go, they all get a chance this season because of the injury, injury situation we have. I think resilience is a great word, and that was definitely what we spoke about in the early stage of the season, where we were letting leads slip. It happened time after time. It happened late against Rotherham. It happened late against Fleetwood. It happened late against Ipswich. It happened late against Coventry. Dropping these points, Accrington had ten men, and we let that lead slip. And that seems, to, apart from that Bolton game, like we've referenced, South End will come to. But as a general whole, as a general whole, on the whole, <laughs> generally, the team is really, as I say, the quality is severely lacking now. And we'll look at some individuals in that. But the resilience, the effort, the levels of effort, the hard work we're putting in, you cannot be, cannot criticise any of our players. I don't think for a lack of effort um, since Glynn has taken charge, and we can't point any fingers at players like like we might have done in the past. Certain central midfielders, maybe. I don't think we can level that at anyone at the current time. No, totally agree. Totally agree. You, we, know, we don't lose a game because we don't work hard enough. We might lose a game because we're not good enough, which is, you know, let's be fair, the Oxford United game, we just weren't good enough. That's the, you know, we did not work hard. We just weren't good enough. Oxford, in my opinion, the best team that we played all season. Yeah, I mean, I think they were as well. And they'd made five... 
pretty significant changes to their lineup when they came to Kings Meadow for that one. That maybe they looked at it as I hate to say one of the easier games, but I don't know how else to phrase it in their schedule. And hence they they did a bit of squad rotation. Still, even with that Oxford game, though, victim of mistakes, weren't we for for both goals? I thought uh, I heard that people were singing Oxford's praises for their winning goal with the pass through and what have you, but. I thought we were poor. I thought we were far too open, which was unusual for us. And the first goal against Oxford came from a, 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 a lot of mistakes in the build-up to that before it was actually an own goal in the end from McLaughlin. So actually, despite that, despite the quality they had, and we didn't really argue about the full-time result, a couple of individual errors eliminate those. We might have picked something up. Yeah, and it's a, it's a learning process. You know, look at the Oxford goal. One of the thing I hate about the Oxford goal is that when Sykes actually scores a goal, he's probably in the six yard area. Trot Trot just seemed to get stranded on his line, which was frustrating. But again, that's you know that's not pointing a finger at Trot because I think he's actually now. I don't. It's interesting now, isn't it? You know, a couple of months ago, people were going, "Oh, I don't know whether I like Trot. I don't think he's that good." Actually, it's all died down a little bit now. I think we've got over the fact that Ramsdale was just a cut above the rest. You know, he just. Ramsdale was just a freak of nature, and that's why he's now you know, number one for for born for the Premier League. Um, but I think Trot, we have a good goalkeeper, um, and but I was just a bit disappointed that he did seem to get stranded on his line for that. But there's no fault for him for the loss. Oxford were just better. But you're right if you if you analyse the goals, they're not great goals to concede. I'd, I'd rather um, I'd rather you know, some great goals go past us and go. Do you know what? Hands down, they were just good. But yeah. It's Oxford, and I don't know Oxford, and you're right. You, we looked at the bench, and you, you you messaged me and said you've seen their bench, and I looked and thought, wow, each of those players probably walks into our team. That was a bit worrying. The Yeah, I mean, the, the fact with Trot, I would say that his weakness and where he was still needs to improve his confidence is certainly with coming off his line in pretty much all circumstances, isn't it? I think that's where he could be more positive. Ramsdale, like you say, and yes, we don't want to compare, but he was he was just such a dominant presence. Trot still has to get that about him. He still needs to bulk up a little bit. He needs to be more prepared to come off his line, especially when balls are played in the box, crosses when crosses come in. And you're right, the Oxford goal, he seems to be, just didn't seem to come off his line. Wedded to his line, it was a bit bizarre. But the first goal against Oxford, I picked up on this, was the fact that for that first half, we had our two strikers, Force and Piggott, pressing, pressing, pressing. So I'm going to link to a point you mentioned earlier about captaincy and perhaps players not being vocal enough. Against Oxford in the first half, those two, Force and Pickett, were pressing, pressing, pressing really hard the pitch onto Oxford's side. <coughs> but then our midfield and our back three, if you want to say in that situation actually a back five, they were so they were almost on top of each other. They were making sure there was no space to play in between the lines. But unfortunately, it meant that all the space was in that area between our midfield and our forwards. So when our forwards are pressing so high, they're sort of... If, if Oxford get past that initial press, which they do quite easily, to be, to be honest with you, they've still they've got this huge gap then for which they can play in. And that's when you need your vocal players to spot that on the pitch, don't you? And have a word with each other. And Piggott as captain, who's actually the one that's pressing and then getting caught out, doesn't speak. If we'd have had yeah, that I, whole yeah. team approach and actually communicated a bit better, then maybe that goal doesn't happen. Yeah, and I think you'll find Glenn's spoke about this a few times, and it seems to be again the, the first half um, problem where we, you know, either show the team too much respect or just don't follow through. Glenn hinted, hinted to that in the Otter game and was asked why, you know, why was the improvement in the second half? And he was like, we just pushed a bit higher and a bit, a bit more of intensity. Because you're right, if the two forwards go and your other midfielders don't push with it, then there's a massive gap in between. And, and Oxford had two playmakers who just filled those gaps with, with ease. So you either all go or none of you go and you just retreat and you try and close the gaps in between between your lines. What we did better in the second half was that actually we pushed as a team probably about 10 yards forward and in the end stopped Oxford playing in their own half because they would do that for, you know, they, they would do that with ease. Um, it's interesting though, what I would say, I'm just a little aside, it's interesting the amount of teams now that are quite happy to play out of the back. Obviously the, the rule now where the goal kick doesn't have to come outside the area means that teams are more confident to, to see you know, some teams have two players in in the box and will happily receive it. Even at League One level, you've got teams doing that. But what I would say, I don't know if you've noticed over the Christmas period, some of the goals that are conceded when teams just try and play too much pretty football. You know, literally I've seen goals where people have been playing balls to centre-halves, losing it, 
and they've had a, you know they've like to see the goal because they're just trying to be too clever. It's like in a way this new rule has encouraged maybe goalkeepers and centre halves that just aren't that good with the ball at their feet. Yeah, and a lot of teams that have come down to Kings Meadow this season have tried to play that way, and we've referenced it on the podcast. Lots of lovely passing, knocking the ball around, but very little cutting edge, especially when when we are on our day as organised as we can be and we get men behind the ball and we defend our box really, really well. And Doncaster were probably the worst victim or exponents of this. Oxford was similar. Even Southend on New Year's Day. Southend liked to get on the ball and pass it around. Rochdale were very similar. OK, second half like you referenced earlier. Yeah, we were hanging on a little bit. But yeah, it's, it's amazing how that seems to be the case. And we are... In contrast to that, we've, we've played a little bit more football of, as of late, but we are still very much a direct team that likes to play on the break and likes to try and get balls in behind as quickly as we can. And it's proven, arguably, just as effective as anything else. Yeah, and I think that was the thing that surprised a few people with the South End game. I, I, I heard quite a few people around me really surprised how confident the South End were. And that's not a problem. We're not, you know, a team at the bottom of the league like South End doesn't mean they're absolute rubbish. It just means they've got no confidence. And, you know, with the, with the goal against South End, what we needed was that second. Because if we got the second, there's no doubt South End would have crumbled. But we didn't. And in the end, South End got the late equaliser, which, if you look back at the goal, Joe Piggott's thought, oh, it just frustrated the hell out of me. You know, he, he gave away the ball so easy on the halfway line. And before we know it, we've got a ball over the back of us. You know, it's just, it's not only a go at Joe Piggott, but sometimes you've just got to be a bit smarter and make sure you don't lose a ball cheaply um, because we did throw away two, two valuable points, really. Yeah, we don't want to make this a Piggott show, but it's quite interesting because actually a few weeks earlier was the Doncaster game, if I remember, and Piggott showed real intelligence in exactly as you're saying there, closing out the game. If you remember in the final stages of that game, he was taking balls into corners, he was pressing, he was holding the ball up well in areas where you'd want the ball to be at those stages. And then against South End, so this is what I referenced earlier with the splitting of opinion. Against Oxford, I actually thought that was arguably Pickett's best game of the season. I thought I, he impressed me a lot that day. Yeah. South End, I'd say, was arguably his worst. Yeah, I just think you should never really, if you're 1-0 up against a team that's in the bottom three, you should never really have a last-minute one-on-one over the back of you. You should never have that. I just don't, you know, you kill the game out of you. It means you all defend or you're not balls into the corners or you do, or you just, you know, just kill the clock. We had one more, from from memory, correct? We had one more sub that was available to us. So we didn't use that. Mm-hmm. So, again, you could argue why has Glenn not done what a lot of teams do, just kill the clock? But you should never really have a one-on-one over the top in the last minute at home. You should, that should really never happen. And, and definitely not from really giving up possession in the centre. You know, Piggott's, in my opinion, you know, just gave the ball away cheaply. And it's just small little details. That's all it is. It's just small little details. It's the difference between a, a draw and a you know one point and three points, which we just need to, especially at home, because we are turning Kings Meadow into some sort. It's not a fortress because that will never be Kings Meadow. But we are starting to really get some good, you know, good performances at home, and we need to just make sure if we can't get our waveform sorted, we just need to pick up maximum points where we can at home. Was the referee correct to award the penalty for Southend on New Year's I Day? I can see why it's given. I can see why it's given. If it was, it's one of those, isn't it? Against us, I think no. Um, but I think if we were in that position, I'd be claiming it. Um, I think it's, I think it's cheap, but it didn't surprise me. The thing is, if you look at it, there's only one thing that that forward can do. He, you know, he, and it's it's so frustrating that we dived in, get the penalty away, and then unfortunately with that, it goes under Trot's body. That's the disappointment thing. I thought Trot had it, and uh, but it found it found some gap underneath his his left hand side. Yeah, there was a small cheer originally from the main stand because it looked like Trot had guessed the right way and got to it, and as you said, just squirmed under him. I thought it was a penalty. I think if Marcus Force is in that, if if roles are reversed and it's Force in the box that goes down, we're absolutely screwing if it's not given. Yeah, so, agree. Yeah, cheap but right decision. Uh, I want to chuck some names at you, a couple of names at you for players over the past month or so. Uh, the first one, we've had the introduction of uh, Jack Rodoni into centre midfield. Unfortunately, he got a knock, and that probably comes from just the amount of games he played over a short space of time, having been thrown in there. Um, but he came into midfield and he's he's impressed. I, there were calls for him. Uh, I think arguably in, in both games, um, both home games, Oxford and Southend, there were calls on Twitter about him being 
a man of the match candidate. I, I think, like you've referenced this many times, there is a little bit of the uh, the yellow and blue tinted spectacles when it comes to our academy players when they come up, um, and who come in and do a good job. I wouldn't have put him, at, you know, man of the match contention for any of these, but there's a lot of potential there, and I was very impressed with him. Got good presence about him. Looks very assured. Very good left foot. Needs to work on his right foot a bit. But bag, bags of potential. I, I'm very excited to see how he's going to develop with us. Yeah, Joe, I thought for the Bristol game and the Oxford game, wasn't yeah. it? Was it Southend? Yeah. I thought, I, I thought the three complemented each other quite well. So we had um, the Doni, O'Reilly, and we had um, Sanders. Sanders in there. And I thought that was a nice balance. It looked like in terms of Sanders can do. We know we know O'Reilly will just you know pick up the pieces and stuff, and and Sanders will you know break things up. And but it felt like there was a good chemistry between the three. They sort of knew where each other was going to be. Rodoni could push on. It also felt in the situation in the South End game, you know, O'Reilly going forward a lot more. Um, great goal that he scored. Um, but I think Rodoni, yeah, do you know what? there's glimpses I saw of him last season that you thought, yeah, do you know what? in terms of a, you know, what is he 17, 18? Mm-hmm. Um, size of him, he's he only get bigger, isn't he? Do you know what I mean? But you know, good height, um, good legs on him, good part. When he wants to go forward, doesn't necessarily look like out of depth going forward because some you know, the midfield role now, just as much as we talk about the, the the fullbacks, you know, it's about also what you do going forward. You know, yes, you want them to be able to defend, but we need to be able to get people from our midfield breaking through and getting goals or at least getting involved and, and not just relying on the forwards to get the goals because without force. You know, we wouldn't really be sharing the goals around the other forwards. But I think he's done really well. I just, again, we have to remember these are kids. Um, so we're not going to get a run of 10, 15 games. You know, we look at Osu recently. He's been dropped and people, I know I've been chatting to people going, well, why has he been dropped? He was breathtaking. You can't, these kids can't play 15, 20 games in a, in a row. Can't sustain that and, level of performance. No, I and mean, this is why we always, you know, with, with you know, Nesta Guinness Walker, we always had that, thankfully, a swap out position where you know now he's got a run of games and you'll probably find going into February Ossie would come back in and probably finish the rest of the season especially you know well done to him for getting an extended contract I think that's a well deserved you know if he didn't I'd be amazed if, he's, if he wasn't knocking on the door for you know a, a improved contract I'd have been amazed because his performances have definitely deserved that the problem he's well, not the problem he's had but the problem that that's brought up or brought back into attention is the fact that he got a knock against Southend and he had to come he had to come off Anthony Hartigan comes on in his place. And if there's ever a, a, a disparity, a contrast between two players at the moment, one of which is going up in everyone's estimation, one that's coming in the opposite direction. Anthony Hartigan, I think, needs a, a move, not a permanent move, maybe just a loan move, some time out elsewhere, just to get his confidence up and maybe plan a team where he can actually get on the ball a little bit more and play to his strengths a bit more. Because in our team currently, it doesn't work. Yeah, I agree. And I think if it wasn't for the fact of the injuries we've got, I think we could well be you know, loading, loading him out for a month or two months. Um, yeah, it's difficult, isn't it? Because we always say with Andy Hartigan, he's very unassuming off the pitch. And even on the pitch, he doesn't talk much. And he's not alone in that. Um, but you sort of sense in him, he's a victim of his own success. You know, So what you're going to look at now is Andy Hartigan coming at 17 was outstanding, but he hasn't pushed on. But now you've got other kids coming in, like Osu, and you've got Radoni coming in. Uh, Paul Hartigan, sorry, Paul Hartigan, um, Paul Calamari coming in. And his lesser known younger brother. <laughs> but what it what it does, it sort of like in a way then puts Annie Hartigan into the into the shadows and people go, one second, this kid's coming in, he's doing great. Annie Hartigan's sort of levelled out, if we're being honest. He hasn't pushed on. Doesn't mean he's a poor player, but he hasn't pushed on as we'd expect. Uh, and, in a way, sometimes the other players coming through put a little bit of, not I would say pressure on him, but probably show that there's some other talented individuals. Hey, look, we're lucky. We know we've got a good academy that is bringing players through. You know, I looked at the loans, the loan outs that we we've had. If you look in the program and you know the loans and loan watch and stuff, we've got a lot of players at our clubs at the moment, which I quite like. The under twenty threes didn't really work in the development league, um, but they're getting games, and um, we're going to benefit from that hopefully. So. Yeah, Andy Hartigan, that loan that loan move would be great for him, but he won't because we just got too many players out. And the last one, Shane McLaughlin. Mm. I'm just chucking a name at you for a player that 
what you know what's just confusing me about not so much about Shane McLaughlin but about the situation is the fact that Luke O'Neill, in the absence of Scott Wagstaff, who's done well in that right wing back position, but Luke McNeil is the obvious choice at the moment to play in that role. But Glenn has kept him at centre half despite us having options at centre half. And unfortunately, McLaughlin, I, I don't think that's. I don't, I don't know about him to be honest with you. No, and he's one of those ones I'll be I'll be interested to see what we're doing in the summer because yes, he's a he's a squad player. That's that's basically what he is. He's filling in, you know, he's sent he's a central midfielder, but won't really you know would you say that he's a he's gonna get in front of Hartigan realistically or Rodoni now? Probably not. Um so we're just finding positions for him. Um and that's not that's it's good to be versatile because we sort of need those players. But yeah, we we we've, we very much know we're not going to change our formation. We're going to play a three-five-two or very similar sort of shape, which means we're going to have two fullbacks or two wing backs that are going to do that. He's filling in a he's filling in a place, but realistically, he's not done what Wagstaff done. If you remember when when O'Reilly, O'Reilly got injured, not O'Reilly, O'Neill got injured initially. Wagstaff come in from playing a centre midfield position, and actually, do you know what you thought? Well, <laughs> that's a good position for Wagstaff and. Yeah, I don't know what he's going to do. Obviously, O'Neill defensively, oh, I think sometimes he switches off. If I'm being honest, I don't think he's a great defender, O'Neill, sometimes. Um, better going forward, a wand of a right foot going forward. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. I don't know what he's going to do, but McLaughlin won't keep his place when waxed off, gets fit. I did note in the last two home games, the amount of times that O'Neill would actually get, like you say, he'd get in really advanced positions. So when the ball came out wide right and McLaughlin was really far forward, McLaughlin would often look to come back and move it backwards to O'Neill, who was given support, and then O'Neill would be the one that would then try and put the cross in the box or move it, switch play or whatever it was. And I mean, it's a bit of a risk, isn't it, when you do that? When you're trying, to, I know Chef, people talk about Sheffield United and what they do with their centre halves. We're not at that level, unfortunately. And um, it's a bit of a risk if you're going to put O'Neill that high up to essentially try and perform two roles, because then when if play breaks down, there's massive gaps that the teams can. Well, he hasn't, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Sorry, I was just going to say, he hasn't got the legs to do that. You know, in terms of the, the now the wing back, if you look at the Premiership, and I'm not going to compare him against, but you think about the Carl Walkers of this world and that, they can go up and down the pitch all day long um, at a pace, but O'Neill can't do that. He hasn't got the legs to, to get back. So if he goes, then someone's got to drop in. So, you know, if McLaughlin in that position isn't confident, then he, you know, he lets him go, he drops in or or you know, Saunders drops in or stuff like that. You're right, the Sheffield United where they're, they're centre-halves, they play a three and their centre-halves will end up sometimes in the, the left or right wing position. But it's a fluid system they've been working over many years. What I would say though with Glenn is that he's, he has said that he wants to get, he's trying to get this system and understand it. And it wouldn't surprise me if he wants to play very much a similar system because as we know, you know, there's always a new... It's like a formation. There's always a new formation that comes up and everyone tries it. Um, the amount of teams that play three five two at the moment is ridiculous and it's just something that happens. Now my favourite formation is the four one four one perfected by David Moyes at Everton because it for me, I'm a football manager, don't concede any goals. It's great. And I could quite happily have thirty eight nil nil draws in the Premier League and survive quite happily. I'd be entertained even if no one else would be. <laughs> I hate conceding goals. It's my biggest thing. I would write, like I said, I'd rather draw nil nil than win five four. But hey, right, we are running very late, Stu. That's sounding great. Uh, we will quickly preview the Portsmouth game and link it to the run of games coming up. You have reference because of Rochdale, their progress in the FA Cup meant our game earlier in the month was cancelled and will be rearranged. And the same will happen at the end of the month with Oxford, which does give us a few free weekends to try and get players back, which is much, which is very useful because we've got a horrendous run. It starts away at Portsmouth on Saturday. After that, we have Peterborough, Burton, Accrington away, Fleetwood, Ipswich, Rotherham. Oh, that's a tough, tough run. It's a big ask of the squad, but let's concentrate on Portsmouth first. Currently, 10th in the division, but just one point outside the playoffs. And over the Christmas period, they actually... Uh, I mean, this is this is typical. They beat Wickham and Ipswich. At the time, they were the top two, uh, but then they lost to Milton Keynes and got a point at Gillingham. Although Gillingham is a tough place to go, as much as I hate admitting that because of their manager, but that is difficult. Um, they won at Fleetwood on the weekends in the third round of the FA Cup. That was a good win away at Fleetwood, and 
Fleetwood seem to have a bit of a mental block. They can't get past the third round of the FA Cup. You'd have thought at home to us last season would have been their year, but no. Same again this year with Portsmouth. They go out. But really, it's a tale of how inconsistent Portsmouth are, and that's why they're not in the top six as everyone thought, and I certainly expected them to be. The only thing is, they are unbeaten at home this season in the league, so that's clearly where their strengths are, and they have goal scorers, and they have so, they have so much quality in that squad, Stu. Like Ronan Curtis, 11 goals this season, attacking midfielder. They've got John Marquis, who started to score goals. Brett Pittman always scores goals. Harness Burgess. And now, of course, they have got Steve Seddon on loan from Birmingham, which is gutting. He is, but he was all, you know, wasn't getting much into the Birmingham squad. So they've done again. They've done it. Birmingham done exactly what he did last time, and and Seddon's gone out on loan. Um, and let's be fair to him; he's got he's got himself a decent loan move. Um, Pom- Pompey is a, an advance on us from last year. You know, taking away the blue and yellow glasses that we we have. Yeah, Pompey at home worrying me. Um, yeah, seven wins at home out of twelve, and won four out of the last six at home. It's yeah, uh, it doesn't fill me much confidence. Uh, especially when you think they've the last two wins they've had was a one 0 win against Ipswich and a two 0 win against Wickham. Looks like the wheels are falling off a little bit of Wickham, um, which is interesting. Funny is interesting, but um, yeah. I, hey, look, Joe. You know if we get a draw, I'll be overjoyed. Um, but we do go into a tough period of games. Anything I say is they are due a defeat. They have they say they haven't lost at home this season. They are due one. And it is a stadium and a crowd at the moment that if you keep things tight and get them energy, they will turn. And that's the classic away sort of situation we want to get into, don't we? Frustrate them, niggle them, annoy them, keep things really tight, which we can do. If we can get to half time, nil nil, or even nick a goal in the break or something, I have a fancy us to see this one through. I would love to share your optimism. Um, I think we get, like I say, if we get away unscathed and get a draw, I'll take that. I don't see us winning. Um, but stranger things have happened. Pompey, in front of their own um, boisterous and arrogant, and we are Premier League fans, you never know. You never know. I mean, after that, like I said, that run of games after, it, it is a night, not a nightmare. Tough run. It is, it's it's tough, yeah, you're right, it is run. a nightmare. I mean, where do you see, where do you see picking up points there, though? Because Peterborough at home, I don't think it's out of the question, because who knows what Peterborough will turn up. Burton, you never know what Burton are going to turn up. And Ipswich, who knows what's going on there at the moment. So there are opportunities there for us to pick up points, but it's, a, it's we difficult. Did, yeah. We have a hell of a week. We literally, if you look between the 8th and the 15th, we have Fleetwood at home on a Saturday, Ipswich at home on a Tuesday, Rotherham away on the Saturday. It's like, wow, do you know what I mean? We, yeah, we, we're, we're going to literally, um, and I think Neil Ardy used to this, like a little mini league, sort of like four, four, around of four games and go, right, you know, if we can get six points out of them, then we're going to do well. And I think that's where we're going to have to look at. And there are going to be, I think there's going to be some tough, tough times ahead in terms of maybe some runs without wins. Um, but if we can get, if we can get into March, then, you know, it definitely opens itself up. But that's why I'm saying, you know, if we're there or thereabouts uh, on the league table, that's not the worst thing in the world because we haven't got that deficit that we had last year. Uh, we're always keeping ourselves around around that. It's like the fifteen hundred meter race. I always say, do you know what I mean? We're in a pack at the moment, and we're just trying to keep ourselves from getting um, stranded at the back. And talking of that pack, this weekend Rochdale host Bolton, and at the time of recording, South End host Tranmere. That game might be postponed because of issues with South End stewarding and payments to South End players, but fixtures in which teams around us will be taking points off each other, which always helps. Yes. Mm. Right. Time to introduce, Stu, our new game. Lovely. Now, this is an interesting one. I didn't know what to call it. I was really struggling for this one. So in the end, Stu, I have gone simply with the new game, Paul Oshu. Oshu. It's kind of like Abdu Ayu, but slightly different. So... This is a bit of a teaser. Really, I suppose what we should probably do with this one is we should probably, in the <coughs> coming weeks, introduce this bit by bit because there are stages to this game and then it will give people more time to think and then it will give you more time to think. But I have selected a former Wimbledon player and I would like you to try and identify who this player is based on a list of players that he has played with, managers he has played for, and then the final clue will be the last his last appearance 
in a Wimbledon shirt. So it, yeah. it is one where you, you do need, it's a bit unfair to just throw all of these clues at you in one go. It's, you need a bit of thinking time and the listeners will need a bit of thinking time. But as it's the first time we're going to do this game, let's just see how it goes so you get an idea of what's happening. So this former Wimbledon player, Stu, in his career has played with, I'll give you five names here, right? At hmm. various clubs. He has played with Neil Ardley, Jolian Lescott, Aaron Wilbraham of Rochdale FA Cup fame, Joe Ledley, and Dean Sturridge. Quite an eclectic bunch of names, but a former Wimbledon FC player has played at one point in his career at different times with all of those names. Any inkling from that list? Hmm. They're quite old players, aren't they, in terms of, you think about Dean Sturridge's... Mm -hmm. um, Neil Sullivan is a trick one because it could have been a... Neil Ardley. Or playing, yeah. I think it might be... They sound like they're ex-Paddis or they've had a Paddis link. Okay. Or something like that. I'm going to go for someone like Andy Roberts. Interesting. Funnily enough, I was going to reference him earlier because Callum Riley... Sorry, Callum O'Reilly seems to have taken on that sort of Andy Roberts mantle, hasn't he, of late. Mm. Um, the Andy Roberts of his generation. Okay, there, there isn't a Paddis link as far as I can tell. Okay. Okay. Um, Neil Largely and Joe Ledley, there's a link there with. Um, you might spot a link there at some Which point. Which would be the Cardiff link. There we go. So, mm, Joe and Lescott, any ideas? So, this player's played with, with all five of them at some point in his career. At some point, yeah. Oh, this is a difficult one, isn't it? Especially the Cardiff link. Um, he might be throwing me off a little bit with that. Do you want the managers? Uh, yeah, go for okay, it. Two managers. I mean, he's played for several, but two managers that he has played for in his career. Dave Jones and Gary Megson. <laughs> mm. Wow. That's really tricky. Uh... Not David Nielsen, is it? Oh, oh, it's not. But his the time frame is right. Right. Okay. As you'll see when uh, I tell you his last Wimbledon game, but yeah. Neil Ship. No, that's a Paddis link again. Oh. Do you can? Dean, oh, go on. Dean Holsworth. Not Dean Holsworth. Can you see a link between Dave Jones and Jolyon Lescott at all? Uh, Try to think now. Who I know they are. Yeah. Hmm. I like this game. It's getting me thinking. I can't think of it. Is though Gary Megson was what Sheffield Wednesday Norwich. His, his <sighs> early Gary Megson's early managerial days. Hmm. Aaron Wilbraham is a link with him. Hmm. No, I can't figure it is. I'd be fascinated to see what the, how the listeners are thinking about yeah. that, wouldn't it? I, so, I almost don't want to give you the answer on air to see what our no, listeners No, don't, say. because I want to see if people who see if people out there can can get the links. That's quite okay. a good one. I like this. This is more this is more my thinking. Yes, you see. It's, it really is interesting when you listen. Okay. And there's one more clue as well, by the way. So the clue is his last Wimbledon appearance was the six two defeat at Grimsby in the old Division One, and that was on the twenty third of March two thousand and two. Well, I think I that's a, a. I think that's a. I was there as well. I think that's a huge clue. I think there's a huge clue if you think about that one. I'm trying to think who played in that game. I'm trying to forget it because it was an absolute nightmare. Um, yeah. Um... I tell you what. If you if you give me a Kevin Kevin Cooper, is that your final answer? Yeah. I was going to say what I'll do is I'll take your final answer. I won't reveal what the answer is. And I'll see what people say. Sounds good. But I can tell you it's not Andy Roberts. No, <laughs> that was just me thinking about a link between the Palace. Yeah. Um, because Wilbraham was at Palace and Sullivan played on one loan game for Palace. He did. So, yeah, yeah. It's just my thinking. Okay, so I'll tell you what, we won't reveal the answer. We'll reveal the answer on next week's show. But do tweet us. We'd love to hear what you think. At 9YRS Podcast. If you're not on Twitter, email us 9YRS at may14.co.uk. Or just even make a comment 
on our website, ninewirespodcast.org, under this week's show's posting. Good. That's the first edition of Poor Os Who. And I, th- I like this game. This one's a keeper, I think. The name might not be. We'll see. <laughs> uh, right. Time to sign off. Very quickly, ladies are back in action this weekend. The, the ladies currently lie second in the Women's National League Division 1 Southeast. And this Sunday, Stu, they host the team in first place. It's a top-of-the-table clash. They host Ipswich Town Ladies at Colston Avenue, Carshalton at 2 p.m. Free entry for everyone, actually. I was going to say season ticket holders, but no, that was the old reserve team system, wasn't it, down at Gander Green Lane. If you had your Wimbledon season ticket, you'd go down to watch the reserves for free. Anyway, uh, first team action indeed this, uh, this Saturday, as we've mentioned. Portsmouth away. Updates at Nine Wireless Podcast on Twitter, and I will be on Love Sport bizarrely randomly, Stu, at about quarter past eight on Saturday evening to discuss the game as well. So, lovesportradio.com about quarter past eight, I'll be on there talking about that game. Happy days. Uh, speaking of Love Sport, the show has moved. Ooh. Uh, yeah, we're not going to say too much, but it's a bit weird. Um, Thursday evenings now at 10 o'clock for the Wimbledon Fan Show. This is because Love Sport have now launched their national station so they want to reserve their sunday evenings for premier league discussion so they've had a schedule move switch around 10 o'clock 10 to 11 p.m on thursday nights no more question time people it's time for wimbledon time or something i don't know um <laughs> loveforradio.com to listen to that or dab national radio for for that one and as i say we've been moved because saturdays are now being reserved for premier league football so if you want to check out the love sports schedule on saturday for that premier league list just have a look see what you think anyway that's that that's it first show of 2020 first show of the decade Stu, any closing comments no just happy new year to everybody and um this is the year we move back to plow lane hopefully that's positive thoughts well thank you very much for joining me no problem. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much for listening. Alexa Bliss, bag first, milk last. We will speak to you again next Friday.